Uh, let me just turn that off. That's better. Hello and welcome as you're entering in to our Zoom meeting today. Uh, if you want to recognize what traditional territories you are coming uh, to us from, that would be lovely. Uh, and if you're not sure, uh, I've got the website native-land.ca up there, and you can take a look at where you are right now and find out what traditional territories are that you are residing upon. Welcome everyone to our discussion today. We're going to talk about creating more inclusive spaces in arts and culture. Um, I'm really excited to have this incredible panel of people here with me to talk about uh, some of the issues that we've all faced individually, some of the barriers that we're working to try to remove, and we are going to get into some really interesting topics. But before we do that, I would like to pass it over to Andrea to do a land acknowledgement for the space that we are residing on today. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, at Presentation House, we do what we call land honoring statements. Uh, we've been doing a lot of work with a variety of uh, Indigenous educators to learn more about the land and our place on the land. And one of the things that I'll share as part of the statement that we learned early on in this process that uh, really struck me was the concept of shared ownership of the land where um, yes, we recognize and honor and are so grateful to the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Peoples who have lived on this land and taken care of it for time in memoriam. And we also recognize that now by living here, we've stepped into that uh, shared ownership of the land, which means we have a joint responsibility to work with them to take care of this land and protect it for all the future generations as well who wanna live here. So. Um, welcome to our virtual home <laughs> and, and to our physical home, you guys here. Um, and and uh, yeah, let's all just take a moment actually and just um, just think about that concept of, of by, by moving here, however we came to be here, that we now um, have stepped into a lineage of, of first peoples who uh, care for and are responsible to this land. Okay, so now I think I'm gonna pass it back to Joyelle, but first I'm gonna introduce <laughs> her. So uh, Joyelle Goldbard is the Arts Education Manager at North Van Arts. In her personal art practice, Joyelle is an ever-evolving multidisciplinary artist, creating paintings, writing, and performing as a singer-songwriter. As a fat, queer woman with mental health disabilities, her work explores themes of identity, place, and longing. She believes in the power of art to transform our greatest wounds into our biggest strengths and is always up for a piece of quality dark chocolate. Sounds always. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrea. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to just run over a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, if you have questions for our lovely panelists, please type them into the chat box and we will be doing a Q&A at the end of the session after each individual has spoken. Um, we will be sending out a recording afterwards. You will get a recording as along with a resource list that we have been compiling for further learning. You can send any questions that you have that we don't end up getting to cover today to myself. Uh, to joyelle at northvanarts.ca and I will forward that along to uh, the speaker who you wanted to connect with. And last couple of things, I wanted to make sure that we acknowledge that no one here is an expert in everything. And I know, I know that may seem like an obvious thing to say, uh, but I know also that we are coming to this work with a great deal of passion for what we are doing, and we are all learning as we go. Uh, and what I hope that we create here today is a space for the not knowing, a space for questions. Uh, we don't have to have all the answers about everything, because we don't. Uh, but we are here with a, a willingness to learn and a desire to do better. In the process of learning, Sometimes it's very uncomfortable. Uh, sometimes 
talking about things as opens up spaces inside of us that are are needing some attention, needing some love. So I would encourage you as you are listening uh, to occasionally tune in to your body and see if anything is coming up. Oftentimes, uh, when overwhelming feelings come in, we might not even identify them as feelings, but just suddenly notice maybe a constriction in your throat or a tightness in your lower back. Pay attention to those and when you need to, feel free because, you know, you're on the other side of a screen. We can't see you. So go ahead, get up, stretch, wiggle around, get a glass of water and ground yourself back into your body if there's a moment where you're feeling really flooded with, uh, with overwhelm. And uh, that goes for all of us too up here. <laughs> so... Before we get into the full introductions of speakers, what I wanted to start out with is identifying a couple of areas for each of us where we might hold privilege and a couple of areas where we might be in more in the living with oppression and having to face that on a daily basis. I don't want this to be an exhaustive list because that's impossible. So that's why I just said, you know, a couple of each is good, but it's as we are coming into this work, if we don't recognize our areas of privilege and oppression, we're kind of completely missing the first step of it. Uh, so I wanted to have, have that be where we start off. Uh, for myself, uh, I uh, hold much privilege as somebody who uh, is financially stable and would even be called middle class. And as a white person, I hold a great deal of privilege. And I recognize that what that means for me is that finances and the color of my skin are not barriers that I face in my daily life to be able to accomplish the things I want to accomplish. Andy, you up. Mm. I have an exhaustive list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'll share a few. Um, that some of my uh, favorite kinds of oppression that I deal with, um, trans misogyny is the big one. That's uh, kind of two-sided, I say, because um, it, is a, it is a privilege to be able to pass in many ways. I'm um, quite fortunate that I, you know, was able to learn how to use makeup and how to do different things that not every trans woman gets. Um, I also have had genetic privilege to not have a lot of facial hair. And that's something that, um, because r removing facial hair is not covered at all, a lot of people have to pay for that out of pocket. And so um, I carry those uh, passing privileges, though I don't believe it, we should have to pass. Um, that's something we can get into later. But um, the other side of things, um, I do carry a lot of privilege being a white person as well, that um, especially in the trans community, uh, the levels of discrimination that we experience um, are very much skewed um, away from white folks towards people of color and indigenous two-spirit folks uh, and people who use terms that I don't even know how to describe yet. I mean, um, indigiqueer is another one that I'm hearing, but uh, there are ways of, of knowing gender that as a white settler, I, I come from that um, perspective. So I have to decolonize that in myself as well. Um, as far as disability goes, there are quite a few. Um, so I uh, will just say this about uh, physical and mental disabilities. Um, I do identify with physical disabilities, though those uh, I feel disabled, but I know that for a lot of artists, they don't like to use the word disability for themselves. Um, or some folks choose to use different words. Um, so one of the words I like to use is neurodivergent. So it basically means that for my mental issues, mm -hmm. um, they are challenging, but they're, they're lifelong. And so I don't wanna say, well, I'm going to have to deal with this lifelong. I'd rather say, well, I have a different brain and there's not something that's wrong with it. There's mm -hmm. just a very different way that it developed from a lot of folks. So um, yeah, that's one where it's kind of a double whammy. But, yeah. I love that. And that's a word that I have started 
thinking about using for myself too, I, because I believe neurodivergent definitely, um, I like the way it feels inside mm. when I'm using that to identify myself. It's, it's much more um, accepting, mm. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Beautiful. Thank you. Andrea, how about you? Um, sure. Yeah. So, um, honestly, my list of privileges is pretty long and my list of oppressions is pretty short. Um, I am a white person. I grew up middle class and that means that I had parents who were able to support me to get an education. I have a university education. My relationship with my body is um, both in terms of how I'm perceived and how it, f it functions. Um, I'm what I've learned the term temporarily able-bodied because of course most people um, experience physical disability at some point in their lives mm -hmm. um, and, and more and more likely as we go through life. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, I love that. That's I, yeah. such a beautiful way to put it. I, I love when I found that term. Yeah, it's great. Temporarily able-bodied. Um, and then I also recognize that I have, in my relationship with my body, I have thin privilege in the world. Um, seats always fit me. I never have to worry about getting a seatbelt extender. Mm -hmm. I don't get judged if I eat a lot of junk food in public. It's, yeah. uh, that makes life easier <laughs> in a yeah. lot of ways. <laughs> <Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> Um, and then I also have that relationship as well with my gender. I'm cisgender and heterosexual. So when people look at me, what assumptions they probably make are correct, which also makes less friction for me moving through the world. And really, um, my one point of oppression is, is being a person who lives in a woman's body. Um, but I also recognize that being a white, cisgendered, middle-class, heterosexual woman, that means that I have been a tool of continuing patriarchal oppression historically, mm -hmm. and people like me are used and participate in oppression of women and people of color and and on and on and colonialism. Uh, yeah, because we are just one step, you know, yeah. <laughs> one step away and yeah. really adjacent to that power. And I think this is an interesting point to talk about because a lot of people really struggle when they're beginning this work. Um, because the thing, I'm not a bad person. Mm -hmm. However, we have all participated in patriarchal, colonial a society because that's the stew we were born into. Mm -hmm. And there are so many ways of thinking that are deeply ingrained from those structures that we have to take a look at and unlearn. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I like to try and think of myself as a blossoming traitor in, in these identities. <laughs> I'm, so not a, I'm not a very aggressive person. I'm a pacifist, so it's hard. But, oh my God. Uh, <laughs> Never say ally again. Blossoming traitor is the only oh. thing I want to know you by. <laughs> there we go. This is a new term, people. It happened today. There we go. <laughs> <sighs> and Giselle. Hi. Um, wow. So I, everyone's so eloquent. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to say. It's funny <laughs> because you asked me yesterday and I was like, oh, um, but I would say I have so much privilege. Um, I, uh, for, for me, English is my first language. Mm -hmm. So that immediately breaks down a gazillion amount of barriers for me. Um, I'm also privileged because, well, I feel I'm privileged because I have an, a slight British accent, which turns everybody ever so slightly, like when, when they hear me on the phone and then they see me in person, they can't quite marry my voice to what I look like. Um, so for me, that's, that's always one of my little power thing about Bobsies that I like to go, uh -huh. You thought I was something else, but now you've got a short black woman telling you what to do. Um, so that's, yeah, so th th that's one of them. Um, I would say I'm also very privileged because my parents worked super hard, like Andrews, to get me an education. Um, I have a university degree. I went to private schools. Um, I'm able to do many, many things in my life. Um, and then, you know, you flip to the oppression side, um, and yeah, I'm a black woman. So there's that. And 
all of the things that come with that. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that I like to really look at is hair and how hair has um, changed my life and how it has evolved in the black community over Mm -hmm. the years that I have um, been alive, essentially. I mean, if you look back, everybody had straight hair. Everybody had to have straight hair. Mm. And, and there is still, it's still out there. Um, and then I cut my, my hair off and I immediately felt more grounded and awakened to who I could become um, and who I strive to become an open, aware person who is comfortable in their bodies. Um, I also am cisgendered and like all of these wonderful things that are in my life, right? Yes. So um, I don't have to, I, I'm very privileged not to have to worry about how I am perceived when I go out. Yeah, clothes mm-hmm. fit me. If I, if they don't, I make them. You know, so <laughs> yeah, she's got some skills. I, I yeah. Really? That, is that, that the theater in you? That is the theater in me, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I guess does that answer the question? Yes, I guess so. absolutely. I there we are. That there, I'm done. And I also have to say that uh, I I first saw you a few weeks ago, after you had already cut your hair off. Yeah. And then I went and did this. <gasps> That's right. <laughs> That's right, because oh, I, I saw it. you, and you had like it was long. I had she very was long bald, hair. Right? Yes, isn't it? Waha, uh-huh. amazing, it is so great. I have saved so much time. You save time, <laughs> money, and that's the thing with black hair. It's so expensive. We can totally get into this as a whole other different topic, but yeah, it is so expensive to maintain. Um, and I did this. The first time I cut my hair off, it was in reaction to breaking up with somebody like 10,000 years ago, it feels like. And then I cut it and I was like, oh, and then I met my love and I was like, I want hair for my wedding. So I remember meeting him and then growing it for the full eight years until we got married. And then I cut it off just so I would have <laughs> luscious locks for the photos. So bizarre, so bizarre. But anyway, that. but yeah. I've done the yeah, same yeah. thing. Like, <laughs> right? I'm literally like, I told my partner like, yeah, I'll just grow my hair out for wedding photos yes. in like eight years. Right? <laughs> I'm planning ahead. Yeah. Yeah, there anyway, you go. there we are. Hair, who knew? It's a mm. thing. Hey, you know, actually, I think hair is such a critical thing um, and we see the ideas about hair so often in mm-hmm. the workplace about what is considered professional mm-hmm. looking hair, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, so we don't often think about the the depth to which our society programs us regarding every single piece of our appearance as to how we should appear to be successful in this world. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And I certainly became conscious of that. Um, I'm a, I am 47 years old and I'm a baby gay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I, I am too. So there you go. <laughs> so I came out a couple of years ago. And previous to that, I had very like long feminine hair. Mm. And I can remember that day of going to the hairdresser and saying, give me my gay haircut, please. Right. I am ready. Mm. Right. Um, And what a terrifying and brave act that is to go against what the culture tells you you are supposed to do because you have uh, one set of genitals versus another. Mm. Totally. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. even these, these smallest of decisions, which may seem like very personal decisions, have great political weight way mm. and a lot of ramification throughout like this huge ramification i mean i walked yeah. into the barber shop um and the first time i got it done and there were all these men sitting there all these beautiful black men in downtown toronto and and i sat down and i was like cut it and it went silent in the barber shop wow absolutely Oof. silent and i was just like Okay, well, I'm going to do it anyway. So right. the first time I'd like it done is like actually by a professional before I just go out and go zzz by myself. Um, and it was silent. And then I'm lucky. I have a very nicely shaped head. You do. so, And so do you, by the way. Thank you. Like you're lucky, right? And, <laughs> and so um, I got it cut and immediately I felt 10 pounds lighter. 
like yeah. just so much free. and then even the the barber he was like you look good i was like yes i do yeah. <laughs> yes i do yes i do mm -hmm. i'm gonna own that yes mm -hmm. anyway Ooh, love it we digress <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our panel, friends. Yes. Yes. Welcome. So <laughs> I am going to introduce each speaker before they talk. We will be starting with Andy and then moving down the line. So I'm going to introduce Andy now, and then Andy is going to share some things with us. So Andy is the social engagement manager for North Van Arts and my lovely co-worker. Keeps me happy mm. and sends me really good songs in the middle of the day when I need a little pick-me-up. And... Uh, and he's also the vice president of the Fund for the Arts in the North Shore. She is a transgender woman who also identifies as non-binary and queer using multiple pronouns. You like to mix it all up with the he, mm -hmm. she, her, they, wherever it goes. And Annie is a North Shore native. You have grown up here since the very first beginning. You uh, And your lived experience really informs your work as an artist and as an arts administrator. Andy was the youngest poet to win a provincial and national spoken word poetry championship in the same year, in 2014. It's my baby Snaps queer year. for everybody. <laughs> that was your baby queer year. That was when I was a baby queer, 2014. Uh, and they have since branched out into clowning, drag, and written word poetry, as well as community engaged arts and arts advocacy. And this fall, Andy is working with a team funded by Creative BC to launch the first transgender art center in so-called Canada, dedicated to making space for trans, two-spirit, non-binary, and gender non-conforming artists. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to learn more about Andy, you can follow Andrew Warner Poetry for radically honest queer storytelling. Mm -hmm. And today, Andy is going to share with us uh, some of the barriers they have faced as a trans artist and some of the work they are doing now with different organizations to make them more accessible for other trans people. So, Andy, over mm -hmm. to you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, absolutely. I should uh, begin with shouting out my lovely earrings um, from Femboyant Designs. They say, if you can see on the camera, my body is not a classroom. And I wear these uh, often in spaces like this just for fun, because it's like, obviously, I am going to talk about my body in this learning atmosphere. So, haha, it is a classroom and my body is it. <laughs> However, <laughs> um, I love to wear these just out and about, because like you mentioned, uh, parts are a big thing, private parts, unfortunately, mm. where sometimes I'll just be grocery shopping and people will want to know what I have. Um, very odd thing to start up a conversation. So <sighs> I like to say, even if I know you, my body is not a classroom uh, and it's not for your learning. So um, so please don't go up to people in the grocery store and ask them about their genitals. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. So, so weird. <laughs> so, I don't even know what to say to that. Right? I know. Try it. Yeah, being there. That's <laughs> awful. Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, that's an example of one. But like I said, we won't get the exhaustive list. Mm. Um, but yeah, something I also share is that I grew up on the North Shore. Um, I, I grew up specifically near uh, the Squamish community known as Hamulchison. Um, so it's near what is colonially known as uh, Capilano Road and Pemberton Heights, that little neighborhood. Um, so I started out there and then I moved all over the North Shore uh, in different places as our wealth changed <laughs> over the years of my upbringing that um, I got to see a lot of the North Shore. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the grocery stores, a lot of the nail salons, a lot of the places that I go for just things that I need and staples, um, people think that they owe or that they are owed access and uh, information from my body that um, really is not okay. But as I've uh, been reflecting on it a lot, I see where a lot of this kind of stuff comes from. And um, I used to go to a church on the North Shore that believed in conversion therapy. Like uh, the North Shore used to have Doug Collins as a regular columnist talking about how femmes should not be walking out in the streets and how gays and homos and all these things are bad. Um, I live in the shadow of all of that darkness, and uh, it's why we don't have as many trans people on the North Shore. We don't have uh, a lot of queer people or queer presence here. 
um, because of so much of our region's history. So um, in addition to the colonization of this land, there's just a lot to um, understand as to why the North Shore is this way. Um, so some of the barriers I wanted to share of um, growing up here, I had an experience where I was able to go out in the world, be queer, be gay, be trans, be non-binary, and be celebrated for that. And that's something that I honestly can never thank my elders enough for, for saving my life and making sure that I could live long enough to, to be here today. So um, I would mention about four or five years ago when I made the choice to live on the North Shore again and work on the North Shore, it was a really difficult decision because I was uh, openly non-binary at the time with my community, <laughs> um, but I knew that the community here would would take years before I would feel safe. Um, and at the time I had short hair too. So um, that's an interesting thing that I would tell people I'm non-binary and I would tell people I'm a uh, trans feminine is what we call it when you're more on the feminine side of the spectrum. Um, but because I had short hair, people would go, oh no, that's masculine. So they would use he, him pronouns or use the name Andrew more often than Andy because what I see is what I know, not what you tell me, just what I see is what I'm going to assume. So um, I knew going into a lot of different spaces with uh, North Van Arts, I'm really happy to be working with you. Um, now in my fourth or fifth year, uh, and also working with North Van Recreation Commission, Recreation and Culture Commission, um, to do a lot of really exciting things in the community. Um, but way back when, uh, when I first made that decision, a lot of the things that I was struggling with, people just had no idea. Um, so one example is access to uh, trans care. A lot of people think that surgeries are covered, hormones are covered, everything, you know, it's like a Disney, a Disney store or a Build-A-Bear workshop where <laughs> there's like a little government office and they're like, welcome trans people. Oh Would you like this? Would you like that? Um, and there are things like changing your name costs at least a thousand dollars to go through all of that and name and gender, I should note. Um, you also have to visit the police, which I don't want to or like doing. Um, but there are all of these uh, things in place that cost so, so much money. Um, so that's why I didn't tell people that I was trans for so long, uh, because I knew that they would not be ready to hear it. Um, and it's really sad, it's really unfortunate that for so many they have to make these decisions on behalf of others. Um, but uh, for me, truly, I mean, explaining how we don't need to have a men's washroom and a women's washroom at North Van Arts, for example, when they're both gender neutral. Um, they're both single stall washrooms, but that was one of my first experiences uh, coming into a, an event. Uh, a volunteer was saying, oh, here's the ladies, here's the men's, you go over there. And I was like, you're literally categorizing me here. Like, no, <laughs> it's a single stall washroom. Like, how do you, how do you have those conversations and explain those concepts when you are the concept? That was my biggest challenge. So um, I know some folks say, oh, well, you came out as trans last year or this year or whenever. Um, but actually, I, I came out to you as trans at that time. Um, I didn't come out to me as trans, and that's what people always forget, is they think my interaction with you is everything, um, when it's completely not at all. My interactions have nothing to do with you um, and my grocery list of things I need. Um, if you want to help buy them, you can do that, and then maybe I'll you know, share some information with you and do more of an even exchange, but um, those things don't happen as often. So. Some of the things that uh, folks I, we see across the North Shore are changing more and more, adding pronouns to their signatures in their emails. That's a really fun thing to see, a cool thing to do. Um, but it is also very basic. It's very minimal, very first step. Not, not even a first step, maybe like a, like a glance. Like you're not even taking action of a step, you know? You're just like, you're, you're doing a very small thing, but uh, it is still necessary. And, 
um, a lot of that comes with education. So um, some things that our staff surely didn't have and, and nobody had on the North Shore. And like, um, we didn't even have a, a, a pride organization at the time. Um, so there was no education. There was no um, resources available. So I ended up saying, well, hey, everyone, I'm going to teach you about pronouns. Um, we had an artist with uh, a legal name um, that was different from their artist name. Um, that was a situation where I got to teach everybody what a dead name is and what does it mean to uh, work with artists who still need the check to clear but cannot uh, access that money as easily as anybody else can. Um, and what's really sad uh, that I'll mention specific to the pandemic is just that for many of us like me, I did all of the work. I changed my name. I did all of the things that I could do before getting vaccinated and my vaccine passport still has my old name on it. Mm -hmm. So when I go out, there's always questions of who is this person because um, yeah, it's a more masculine name that people don't seem to know how to register. So in terms of education, it's one thing to have pronouns in your email signatures, but it's a whole nother thing to be living in a pandemic and have to train uh, people just checking vaccine passports. Do you know any trans people? Do you know how to talk to trans people? Um, there are levels of education that have to happen on so many levels that mm -hmm. are currently uh, very slow to happen. So, um, those are some of the level one areas you can do is getting education for your team, adding pronouns, learning more. Um, but some of the real costly changes that I encourage all folks to get that um, I know Presentation House Theater has gotten recently that I'm so happy to see. You know what I'm talking about, Giselle. You know. <laughs> um, bathrooms. Yay. Everybody can pee. Yes. Everybody can pee. Just everybody. wash your hands. We don't care. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That um, for some reason people care. Uh, so that's one that um, it is really nice to, if you can, access the funding or the grants or whatever you need to get that those changes done, uh, a lot of the times it doesn't actually cost a lot to say this is a gender neutral bathroom um, because the plumbing is already there, uh, the <laughs> stalls are already there. Um, so yeah, things like that are quite easy to do, but they do cost a bit more money. And then the third level um, of barriers that uh, a lot of trans folks have to face are the real finances that we ourselves have to pay that um, our employers aren't paying for, our insurance doesn't pay for, the community doesn't pay for, unless you do a big GoFundMe fundraiser. But I don't believe that trans people should have to constantly be asking the public for money and mm -hmm. sharing our stories in such vulnerable ways yeah. simply so that we can survive long enough. Um, I think it would be lovely if we could do uh, fundraisers where we just say, you know what, you don't even tell us what surgery you're getting. We just know you're trans and you need a lot of support right now. Um, so some of those things, like I mentioned surgery, there are a lot of different kinds, um, but not a lot of people know that up until 2019 and late 2019, so basically 2020 and COVID, there was only uh, one lower surgery clinic in Canada and that's in Montreal. So if you wanted lower surgery, you'd have to pay for flights, uh, and as well fly back after getting, you know, one of the biggest surgeries of your life potentially. Um, so there are a lot of levels of access that are so invisible um, that I get people asking me like, oh, don't you get to choose where you have your surgery? And isn't it so much fun like getting to pick? <laughs> um, but it's not because you really don't have options. You don't have uh, that kind of stuff. Um, Hormones as well. My hormones are not covered by BC, by Transcare. Um, and right now, something we're working on at North Van Arts that I'm really grateful for my team to be able to support me in, in these endeavors is uh, getting our health insurance to have better coverage for trans people. Because, um, yeah, hormones are a, a regular monthly thing uh, that, unfortunately, um, people often think or take for granted as something free that we just have because the only person they know is Caitlyn Jenner and she's a millionaire. So of course, why aren't you getting this done, that done, this done, that done, this done, that done? Um, my body's not a shopping cart. It's not really something that uh, is for other people to decide 
how to improve. Um, and that's, that's really important for, for you to get, is just that my body doesn't need improvement. Um, though I might make changes to my body and I um, have full consent with my bodily autonomy to make those, that doesn't mean that they're for everybody in the public to know about. It doesn't mean that um, it's going to help you on your journey of learning. Um, you have the internet, you have potentially money that you could hire trans educators and trans people to really sit through this stuff with you so that you can be a better ally to people in your life. Um, so with all of those barriers in hand, over the last four or five years that I've been on the North Shore, We've been working through a lot of them, not only uh, at North Van Arts, but all over arts and cultural organizations. Um, so one thing I'm really excited to see coming up soon that you can all check out um, are my blogs for the North Vancouver Recreation and Culture Commission. I've got a new one coming out about transgender people in bathrooms. Mm -hmm. Bathrooms, change rooms, uh, toilet rooms, because there's no bath in there. Let's be honest, that's a <laughs> euphemism. Um, and I, I'm grateful to NVRC as well for giving that support to say, you know, it's it's not your job to supervise the facilities if you're an average Joe. Um, it's the rec center's job. So when people try to do that gatekeeping of uh, bathrooms, an example I'll use is um, in a family bathroom, I was using it because it was a single stall and I was like, I, I need this. <laughs> um, someone was like, hey, like you're not a family. And I was like, uh, are, and first of all, the person saying this was like, that's a family restroom, but they did not clearly have a family unit with them. So I was like, unless you need it, like, no. <laughs> um, before I realized, like, I don't have to have this conversation with you. I can close the door and lock it. Like, there's no, there's, there's no necessity for me to be here for you to have that moment of understanding for yourself. And so um, I'm grateful to NVRC for being able to support uh, trans people accessing just regular community services like a pool without having to, uh, you know, bend ourselves in all sorts of ways uh, to fit in and to pass into what is acceptable for other people. Um, and we will share that blog post in the resource page that mm -hmm. I send out later. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so ending on some solutions, uh, there are some that are more, that are easier to do that um, surely you can check off on your lists. Um, but in the long term, I really would encourage everyone to think about um, how can you make specifically transgender artists feel more supported in their work? Um, because trans people in general, you know, you can be a trans woman and an accountant and still have enough income to pay for this kind of stuff. I don't know how much accountants make. I just want to be clear about that. I am an artist, so I can only speak for the arts. But um, for transgender artists, when they are working in your spaces and when they are showing up to things, just make sure that you know um, we don't owe you everything. So mm -hmm. one of the ways I'm excited to do that is with the Transgender Expressions Haven. Um, this will be the first, as far as we know, <laughs> arts uh, center that that is solely dedicated to trans plus people. Um, and I'm really excited about that because our official launch is actually in December. Uh, but if you want to check it out, you can go to The Haven, H-A-V-E-N. It's like heaven, but minus a letter. Um, <laughs> who knows why? <laughs> um, so you can check out thehaven.lgbt, our website or our social media. Um, so we'll have all sorts of resources on there and things coming out um, for yeah the next uh, few years or at least, as long as our funding lasts. Yay. And I will include that in the resource mm -hmm. list as well. That's so fantastic. Thank you so much, Andy. Thank you. Uh, if you I mean, there's no one here. We should. We want to applaud. Oh. Yes. I like snaps there's no, too. There's no, there's no, we, snaps are always I good. I also yeah. default to this a lot. Mm -hmm. I love this that. I, nice. Yeah, mm -hmm. I learned about that recently and I thought that's so beautiful. This one? Yeah. yeah, I learned about it first in deaf spaces, of course, because yeah. it's not auditory based. And then some of my friends who do improv, somehow it's made it into that community as mm. well as like, I'm not interrupting the conversation, but I just love what you said. Mm. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, because snaps, depending on the poet, some snaps are like, Hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mine are kind of sad. I can never quite get that snap. Mm. <laughs> 
If you have questions for Andy, please put them into the chat box and we will bring those up later when we have our Q&A. But next up, I get the pleasure of introducing Andrea. Andrea Lowen is a theater person and a writer. She primarily works as the managing director of Presentation House Theater, where she takes particular joy in creating spaces for emerging and underserved artists to create work and flourish. She is also a writer, currently contributing a monthly column called Acts of Resistance to Loose Lips Magazine, which I checked out and you should definitely check out. It's fantastic. It's awesome. I will include Loose Lips Magazine also in our resource section because they're pretty amazing. And, uh, and she enjoys riding her bike, cuddling with her cat, which I fully support that decision because mm -hmm. that's one of my favorite pastimes too. And always having a cup of tea nearby. Yeah, I feel really weird now without a cup of tea, honestly. I have a <laughs> yeah, it's not cup the same. of water, but it's not the same. <laughs> and Andrea is going to talk about some of the initiatives that they've been undertaking here at Presentation House Theater in terms of reconciliation and anti-racism work. So I'm very excited to hear about this. Yeah, yeah. So um, first of all, I always think it's valuable to talk a little bit about your background, where you came from. So um, I grew up very nearby on Stalo territory, um, also known as Abbotsford. And as many people who live in that region, my family is ethnically Mennonite on both sides, uh, which for people who aren't familiar means that um, in terms of background, um, it's sort of Dutch German folks who split off from the mainstream Christian culture there and created their own uh, version uh, with a focus on pacifism and then wound up because of being pacifist, sort of getting bumped around Europe for a while because you don't like having pacifists in your country when there's wars. Um, so we got bumped <laughs> around a bunch uh, and also a tendency for seclusion um, until finally uh, there were big waves that came over around when my grandparents came over from Russia, uh, which, which was the last place that we kind of settled in Europe. I uh, came over here, settled for a bit in the prairies before coming out to Abbotsford, um, where both of my grandparents wound up being, and that's how my parents met. Um, and despite uh, Mennonites being a pretty conservative culture, um, I actually feel like a lot of the values I grew up with um, in my Mennonite background of pacifism, the two big ones I think being pacifism and the idea of practical care for one another, um, really lent me to uh, galvanize the work I do now and the focus I have in my life on equity and inclusion in general and anti-racism and decolonization more specifically. Um, I don't see how you can be peaceful and take care of one another if you don't have those values. <laughs> I was paying attention. <laughs> So now here at Presentation House, one of the things that actually drew me to work here in the first place was that I could tell just from the outside that on a very basic level, this was a company that kind of got it when it come to basic principles of equity and inclusion. Um, and when I say got it, I kind of mean, you know, you still have a lot of people in the world who don't even understand that these are issues that matter, that people actually face these barriers, that, that if you're running an organization, you maybe have a responsibility to try and ease the path of these barriers for people and and uh, and make your space feel inclusive and welcoming for all. So I could tell that that was already happening here. Um, two examples of that are that there were already pretty strong relationships with a lot of local Indigenous artists, as well as you've already mentioned the gender neutral washrooms, <laughs> although I have a story about that later <laughs> if we Can't have wait. time. Um, so since I came in here, one thing I really have focused on is trying to make these values that I think already really existed here um, systemic within the organization. I think a common problem that theater companies and a lot of smaller organizations face is that um, these kinds of values of equity and inclusion or anti-racism and you know whatever different labels you put on it, um, they might be really strong in some of the individuals who work at a company. There might be a few programs or initiatives related to them. Um, but the, the downside is that it's really relying on those people's passion and time. So if that if someone happens to move on to a different company or if things happen to get really, really busy and stressful, then some of that stuff can fall away, um, despite perhaps everyone's best intentions. And I kind of realized that, well, if racism and sexism and everything else and colonialism is systemic, then we can probably try and make equity systemic as well. 
So that's kind of what, yeah, what I try and do. So there are some smaller ways I've tried to do this. Is, and yeah, the, when I first talked to you about this, it was really focused on the anti-racism and decolonizing, but then I'm trying to give a few more examples since you mentioned that that's not all we're talking about here today. Um, so yeah, some pretty basic things. One is like super bare bones and it's not glamorous, but I'm also a big nerd and I love doing it, which is revisiting all the policies and making sure that companies, mm -hmm. again, smaller organizations, arts organizations often don't just don't have thorough or robust policies. And PHT does did have policies, um, but really going through them and making sure that they are a good foundation for equity, that they recognize barriers and that the policies are written in a way to try and uh, reduce and, and overcome them in, in various ways. So yeah, that's one thing. I just I actually just emailed the staff like two days ago because basically for the past two and a half years I've been working here, I've been like slowly chipping away <laughs> at our policies and trying to make it a, a more comprehensive document. I said, guys, I finally finished. And then of course I thought of something yesterday that of I need to add. So. <laughs> of course you <laughs> did. But it's, yeah, anyway. Yeah. So, so this actually, is an important point too because yeah, this yeah. is ongoing work. Yeah. There is no magical end point that any of us are going to get to here. No, yeah. And the thing I actually came across that I think is so cool is I saw in, a, in one of these like women in leadership groups that I'm in. Um, I actually do value these groups. I know. Um, <laughs> is that someone posted that they had just implemented a policy that basically says, hey, for stat holidays, because so many revolve around the Christian calendar here in our society, kind of said, you know, if, if a holiday falls on a day that's not important for your beliefs or your cultural practice, but you have one that's not a holiday, you can just swap. You can just swap your holidays. And I was like, oh, that's really cool. So, And that's um, one area where there's so much un you. unacknowledged privilege. <laughs> that's going to be what? It's going to be in our new, one of our new policies. It's going to be in one of our new policies. Oh, so yeah, I'm going to add that into the document. <laughs> that's great. Hopefully tomorrow. That's exciting. Um, yeah, so stuff like that. Um, and then another way that we've been changing, and Giselle and I work on this together a lot, is it's with our contracts and how we contract artists. And... Um, I've been learning a lot about trying to recognize and change the way contracts are framed to recognize the power differential between, you know, the employing company. We don't feel like a big monolith, but I know it's like when you've got someone being like, here's the piece of paper you have to sign to get paid, it feels differently. So really trying to read it through that lens, making sure the team terms are equitable. We added a clause recently, um, I think about a year and a half ago about ceremonial practices and um, kind of outlining the the welcome of ceremonial practices and then just some of the logistics that need to happen. For example, if you're doing smudging or something that generates smoke, like just how that works. But that way it's just in there and people just know mm -hmm. if this is part of your practice, you're welcome to do it. We also have a list of company values now that's included in all our contracts that says, you know, we're both agreeing to abide by these values, which also means that if the artist feels like we're not abiding by those values, like they can come to us and say, you're not following your contract. <laughs> you're mm -hmm. supposed to be treating me with humanity and I don't think you are. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you know, that gives them something. Um, I've also been trying to introduce more qualitative language in um, not just the details around like how much you're getting paid and what dates and deliverables, but um, the intention and goal of what we're trying to do together when we hire an artist. Um, again, just so it's, um, give something a bit more meaningful to grasp onto and to fall back on if things get frictiony. Um, and, and also working with the staff team and getting them like, at first it was just sort of like, well, you're the managing director, so you write the contracts and then they get signed. And I hated that because I would get so stressed out that I might forget something. And then the staff would sometimes be like, oh, why didn't you put this in the LOA? And I'd be like, <laughs> oh yeah, it doesn't have to be a hierarchical structure where I write the contract and like, I share it, like I send it to Giselle, I send it to the rest of the staff and I'll say, hey, is there anything you want to make sure is in this contract? Because this affects your job too. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing there. Um, and another thing we've got had in place and we've expanded is financial accessibility. So we've had at least for about a year, I think before I came on, the choose your own price model, which basically instead of saying, you know, 
well, these distinct groups get a discount because we think you're more likely to have less money, like students and seniors or, you know, that kind of thing. We said, you know what? People have all sorts of financial circumstances for all sorts of different phases of life, and we don't know what they are, and we don't want to tell you when you do and don't have money. So we just give three prices for every show and say, you pick the one that you want to pay. No questions asked. You don't have to justify it to us. People still feel kind of uncomfortable with that and they want to justify it. But yes. if, if we're having a conversation with them for online ticketing, I think it feels less frictiony for people. But um, but really, it's just, you know, whatever, pick your price. Um, and then we've just added a pay what you can model on top of that, which is basically like a on, it's sort of like an on-call system. So it's like if even our lowest tier price is not accessible to you, you kind of just fill in a form and say, these are the dates that I'd like to come see the show. And then if we have tickets available, we'll contact you and you'll get tickets. So, and that again, there's like, you don't have to justify why you can't pay the price. You just fill in the form and it's all good. That is so important. And mm -hmm. that's, um, I have implemented in, in all of our arts education programming, um, a discounted price. And it's, I, I have to say, I, I have a beautiful story, story to share about that because this summer um, I had some people reach out to me because all of the full price tickets were gone and there was only the discounted tickets left. And they said, several of the people said to me, can I, di can I donate the balance right. to, to North Van Arts? Uh, because I know I could afford the full price. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of people are really scared. Uh, to implement policies like that because there's this idea out there that somehow everybody's going to try to rip you off. Mm. Um, and I would just like to debunk that and say people are incredibly generous in more ways than you can think of. And if you're thinking that uh, you want to try that out, please please do for your organization because it makes a huge difference for the people who need it and the people who don't need it, they're okay. Yeah, absolutely. I think you're right. Within capitalism, we really assume that everyone's just out for themselves. And most of the time, most of us aren't. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like, what's the worst thing that a couple people pay less than they could have afforded to, but then someone who couldn't afford to has the option? Like, Right, exactly. You know? <laughs> Um, oh, and then and then a, the big project we're working on right now is around the decolonization of our space. So this stemmed from um, a few conversations we had basically about how the, those standard land acknowledgements were not really serving either the um, Indigenous folks that we work with who kind of felt like... Like what? It, what? What are you really doing here? And then um, some people in the settler community who kind of either felt frictioned from it or or couldn't understand because simply standing up and and saying the names of some territories isn't really meaningful and and they didn't have the background of knowledge to know kind of what we were trying to do. And so we started examining, well, what, what are we really trying to do? What is this process? What are the protocols of the territory? How does this really work? Like. Um, and we're now in this multi-phase project of um, sort of education and one big stream of it is a physical grounding of the space in the land and the protocols and history of the land where we're working with uh, Squamish artist Becky Duncan alongside settler artist Joel Grinke and they're creating a whole variety of um, sort of installations and things around the space. So basically whenever you come to the theater or to our grounds at the end of this, I mean, end, as we've said, ongoing processes, but end of this project, this phase, <laughs> people kind of won't be able to come here without encountering the territory in some way. Um, right now they've got a video installation. They've got, um, we've got this thing called the talking tree outside. That's a sort of motion activated tree that tells you stories. And it includes the story of the two sisters, um, also known as the Twin Lions. For those of you who don't know, the original story of those mountains is the two sisters. And you can come to our talking tree and hear the story and learn what it is or Google it. <laughs> <laughs> It'd be better if you just came. You, it's, you, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, a lot more fun. Story. It's a beautiful story and Becky tells it so yeah. well. Yeah. Um, there, we're getting a painting that's gonna be sort of a painting of the whole North Shore that includes references uh, to the original place names and original sort of histories and mythologies of the land. Um, they're going to hang cedar. Anyways, there's a whole series of things that are going to happen um, around the physical space. And then operationally, we're just finalizing um, doing a sort of assessment and plan for decolonizing our operations. And that's um, 
kind of looking at just like how we do our work, how our admin meetings work, how our board meetings run, how our rehearsal processes work, how we hire people, just like all that kind of stuff and kind of looking at that through a decolonial lens. Um, so that's our big project, it's ongoing. Multi phases again, we'll never stop, but yes. <laughs> luckily, so luckily, there was some funding that was available from BC Arts Council, so we actually could invest a pretty good chunk of money and then time into doing this work. And then I had one other do I have time to tell a story about a mistake or no? <laughs> Always, I would love you to save that for okay. when we do the <laughs> okay, because well, I always think it's think valuable we'll start off to the share Q &A with, with that story, yeah, sure, okay. sure, sure, okay. okay. Um, and I wanted to say that. Um, you know, you mentioned that you got funding from the BC Arts Council to do this work. And this is uh, one of the big barriers that a lot of organizations face is your staff are already overworked and underpaid. Mm -hmm. And you, they don't have capacity to take on more and you don't have funding to offer them more. So um, it is so wonderful to see these kind of grants uh, opening up these opportunities. Absolutely. And I just actually want to add to that because a lot of people will be like, well, just readjust your priorities and reallocate your money. And to a degree that can be done, but also funding for nonprofits, as you two, I'm sure know, is very much tied to the activities the funder cares about. And so if we just reallocate other funds we got to these activities, then our funders go, well, you were supposed to spend that money putting on plays or you were supposed to spend that money on X. Right. And now we're not you know, satisfying those, and then you, and then you, you lose money. Like there's a lot of risk involved there. So mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Andrea. Yeah. So our final speaker for today is Giselle and Giselle hails from England and is very happy to be here. <laughs> she is the production coordinator and facilities manager at Presentation House Theatre. And her Black History Matters program educates students from kindergarten to grade seven about Black Canadian history through the arts. And to tell us a little bit more about some of Canada's history, we are so excited to hear today. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Da, 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 da. So because I am a production coordinator and a stage manager, I need my script. So uh, we're just going to do it this way. Everyone's so lovely and they're just like did a little notes. I'm like, no, I've got a binder. So um, yeah. So thank you, Joelle. As uh, Joelle said, um, Black History Matters is a program that has meaningful interactions with elementary school aged children on the North Shore in their classroom on the topic of Black history in Canada. And starting in kindergarten and all the way up to grade seven, students are given the opportunity to learn about Black history from Black educators, artists, and community leaders. The content is tailored to the appropriate grade, and working with the young on an essential part of Canadian history will inform and allow them to connect and question not only the past, but the present and their future. So what I've prepared for you today is an overview, essentially, of the racist history here in BC using some of the same tools that I use in my program. So Canada has a love-hate relationship with racism, exclusion, and disenfranchisement. As Canadians, we like to think of ourselves as the friendly folk to the north of our loud, brash, and outspoken American neighbors. We peek over the fence and say, phew, I'm glad that's not us. But as the world has got smaller with the inventions of the 20th and 21st centuries, we can see that while we may not be as loud or as brash, we too have a quieter form of systemic racism, exclusion, and disenfranchisement. White privilege lives and thrives quite well here, shown by the constant gurgle of injustices that have been happening for centuries. We pride ourselves on being able to talk about things without resulting to violence. Canadians listen to the other person's point of view and then willfully ignore it and do what we want anyway. As an immigrant to this country, I was taught about all the good things about where I was coming to. Indeed, I had to take a test to prove I had learnt it. But I wasn't informed about the shady past and present of the country that I choose to call my own. It behooves us to learn about these things, for when we call a country our own, we should know of it. All of it. 
warts, beauty marks, and scars. For while we celebrate the joys and the accomplishments, we need to acknowledge the pain and never forget the injustices. This image you will see throughout the presentation is the Sankofa bird. It hails from the Akan tribe in Ghana and represents the belief that as we move forward, we must learn from the past. Some of the images throughout the presentation may be difficult for you. Please take care of yourself as we navigate these difficult topics. British Columbia has a vast wilderness of mountains, trees, and natural beauty. It's no wonder that so many people flock to this part of the country seeking to cure what ails them, be it fame, fortune, or freedom. The start of BC's rich Black history begins with the arrival of the settlers from the Pioneer Committee formed by the Black community in San Francisco. They received a letter from a gentleman in the servants of the Hudson's Bay Company of undoubted veracity, giving details about the colony and welcoming the Blacks. This was Governor James Douglas, whose mother was a free colored woman from Barbados. The first group, about 800 people, landed in Victoria in April of 1858. A great trailblazer was Mifflin Wistar Gibbs, best name ever, I would just like to say. <laughs> And he was born in Philadelphia, and by the time he decided to join the emigration to Victoria, he was already an established businessman and advocate. In November of 1866, Gibbs was elected to the Victoria City Council, representing the James Bay District, where he had purchased land and built a house, the first black man to do so. He supported Confederation and was the delegate for Salt Spring Island at the Yale Convention in 1868. A gathering called to debate the question of BC joining the Confederation of Canada or going for annexation to the United States. Gibbs was firmly on the side of staying with Canada and helped to frame the terms by which British Columbia entered the Canadian Federation. Fielding William Spots Jr. Again, an amazing name. I don't know why we don't have names like that anymore. He was one of the first blacks to move from Vancouver Island to Strathcona as the center of the economic power shifted to Vancouver in the early 1900s. Within a few years, a narrow lane running from Maine to Jackson between Union and Pryor is called Hogan's Alley. Its residents are black, Asian, Italian, Japanese, and Chinese. Fast forward a couple of decades, and by 1930, the city declares Eastern Strathcona as industrial. This makes mortgages for money or money for renovations difficult to get, and the neighborhood begins to deteriorate. A quote from the Daily Province on April 21st, 1939 says, to the average citizen, Hogan's Alley stands for three things squalor, immorality, and crime. Hogan's Alley has the name which conjures up images of bootleggers, canned heaters, prostitutes, and all types of criminals. Police records bear this out. In the late 50s, the city declares Strathcona an urban blight and ceases to maintain the neighborhood sidewalks, roads, and services. In 1971, the city approved a new Georgia viaduct that destroyed two blocks of Hogan's Alley and many homes and businesses. The thriving black community was completely gone by the end of the decade. In the late 1800s, the First Nations people of Canada were having more and more of their rights and freedoms taken away. Settlers had already taken their land, enslaved around 2,600 of them, and called them the Pani. And now more earnestly, they were taking their children. In 1867, the government took over the power of the indigenous peoples and their education. Not 10 years later, they would take control over their rights and culture with the Indian Act. Within a few years, the government required all children, aged seven through 16, to attend residential schools. These schools stripped children of their dignity, their heritage, their language, and their families. The atrocities went on for decades. 
The highly regimented system afforded no respite from the cultural erosion and the mental and physical torture. During the 1960s, more than 20,000 children were taken by the government social workers and placed in foster care or adoption homes with non-Indigenous families while residential schools were still active. Let's pause for a moment and let that really sink in. Because of the color of your skin, because your culture is deemed uncivilized to the European eye, the government had the right to come into your home and take your child, and you don't know if you will ever see them again. A survivor of a residential school said of her experience, I felt so small and I was very scared. There were white beds, like hospital beds. I remember being taken into a large shower room where I was stripped down and I was showered. I never had anybody but my mother touch me. So that was scary in itself, having someone I didn't know bathe me. One of the punishments of speaking our language and losing our tokens was to hold your tongue. By the time I am four years old, there are still thousands enrolled in schools around the country. And by the time I am in midway through university in 1996, the last residential school, Gordon's Residential School, closes. That's how recent it is. Thousands of children died due to Canada's residential school system and more than 80,000 survivors and their families still live with its legacy. While the federal government was taking away their children, the provincial government of BC was taking away the lands of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh to allow for development and create spaces for white people to relax. Stanley Park, was one of these places. The Squamish had lived there for centuries, raising their families, living off the land and the abundant waters that surrounded the area. The local and federal government sought to remove the community on Brockton Point by proving in court that the families hadn't lived there long enough to have land rights. The only people who could testify to how long the community had been there were the First Nations peoples, and it was agreed by the courts that Indigenous people weren't reliable witnesses because they didn't know how to tell time. In 1931, the houses at Brockton Point were burned down and families were removed. In 2018, there was an audit approved by the Vancouver Park Board to look into the colonial practices, including the removal of the First Nations people from the city parks. The late 1800s also saw the rise of immigration to BC from the East. Ever since the first Japanese person landed in New Westminster, white settlers have tried to exclude them. They passed laws to keep Japanese people from working in the mines, to limit their earnings from fishing and logging, to prevent them from voting, and to prohibit them from working on any project funded by the province. This came to a head in 1941 with the bombing of Pearl Harbor. BC officials seized fishing boats, shut down all Japanese language newspapers and schools, all cameras and shortwave radios were confiscated and a curfew was implemented. By March of 1942, BC ordered the removal of all Japanese Canadians. 23,000 men, women, and children were forced from their homes, despite over 75% of them being Canadian-born or naturalized. They were herded to the Hastings Exhibition Grounds in Vancouver and treated like cattle. After weeks or months in these inhumane conditions, about 12,000 people were sent to isolated internment camps in the BC interior, Men were separated from their families and forced to do physical labor, building roads. Those who were seen as protesters were sent to prisoner of war camps and families were sent to Alberta or Manitoba and claimed by sugar beet farmers to help fill labor shortages. The federal government used the War Measures Act, which granted the state sweeping powers to suspend the basic human rights and freedoms of Canadian citizens. 
And if you think that once the war was over, the government would allow people to return to their homes, you would be wrong. Japanese Canadians were banned from returning to BC, and about 4,000 of them, many of whom were born in Canada, were exiled to a war-ravaged Japan they did not know. They had lost their lands and property and received little or no compensation. The government had sold it to pay for the internment camps. It wasn't until 1949 that Japanese Canadians could move freely throughout the country and were allowed back into BC and were given the right to vote. They faced extreme racism and had a very difficult time finding housing, lodging, and jobs. In 1984, the National Association of Japanese Canadians submitted a brief entitled Democracy Betrayed, the Case for Redress. And they based their appeal on the Canadian Charter of Human Rights. And it said in part, as a visible minority that has experienced legalized repression under the War Measures Act, we urge the government of Canada to take steps as are necessary to ensure that Canadians are never again subjected to such injustices. In particular, we urge the fundamental human rights and freedoms set forth in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms to be considered sacrosanct, non-negotiable, and beyond the reach of any arbitrary legis legislation, such as the War Measures Act. It took until 1988 for the government to officially apologize and offer token compensation to the Japanese Canadian community. The European settlers of the 1800s were also known for their sense of wonder and accomplishments. But at what cost? From 1881 to 1885, more than 15,000 Chinese laborers came to work on the construction on the Canadian Pacific Railway. Once it was close to completion, the BC government tried to ban Chinese immigration. Once Prime Minister Macdonald willingly gave way to the prejudice and pressures of trade, union, trade unionists and politicians, a head tax was imposed and details of all Chinese people arriving were written in large ledger books. Oh yes, Canada had its own book of Negroes. Each person arriving between 1885 and 1923 had to pay at least $50. It was raised to $100 and then $500 to stem the tide of immigration. Only the wealthy could afford this head tax, as $50 in 1885 was akin to one-third of a yearly wage. In 1923, the head tax was supplemented with the Chinese Immigration Act, this act banned all Chinese emigrants, with very few exceptions to those who could pay the increased head tax, until its repeal in 1949. The Chinese Immigration Act perpetuated systemic and institutional racism with more than 100 other policies. It denied them the right to vote, to practice law or medicine, to hold public office, to, sleek, to seek employment on public works, or to own crown land. The head tax made it financially impossible to bring families. And if you managed to make it to Canada, you were issued certificates as proof of head tax payment. During the 38 years the tax was in effect, around 82,000 Chinese immigrants paid nearly $23 million. Two national organizations, the Chinese Canadian National Council and the National Congress of Chinese Canadians, pressured the government to acknowledge and address this historic, this horrific history. And it wouldn't be until 2006 that Prime Minister Stephen Harper apologized to head tax head taxpayers, their families, and the Chinese Canadian community. Negotiations are still ongoing, as fewer than 50 head taxpayers were among the 785 who received payments in 2009. Many descendants continue the redress campaign for family members excluded from the 2006 settlement. Once the government got rid of or stemmed the tide of immigration from China, they realized they needed more laborers. And at that time, Canada was still under British rule, as was India. Ignorance and racism once again rose its ugly head within the government, and South Asians were provincially disenfranchised. 
They were denied the right to vote, access to political office, jury duty, public service jobs, and labor on public works. In 1908, Canada enacted the Continuous Ticketing Provision, which stated that you must have direct passage from the place of your birth or citizenship to Canada. This was directly targeted at India as other countries were able to make the direct route. South Asians also had to have $200 to enter the country. This immigration ban was directly challenged in 1914 when a freighter called the Komagata Maru sailed from Hong Kong with 376 high status, elite land-owning families who were prospective immigrants. The Komagata Maru sailed into Vancouver Harbor on May 21st, 1914, and their passengers were denied entry. Passengers were forced to remain on board for two months. With provisions running low, the Musqueam would row out to provide food and water to the stranded would-be immigrants. Eventually, with their legal battles denied and morale low, the ship left Vancouver to return to India. The, con the continuous journey provision remained law until 1947. With the approach of Indian independence, Canada shifted their policies to annual immigration quotas. The annual immigration quota from India would be 150 people. The friendship that was formed between the South Asian community and the Musqueam back in 1914 has not been forgotten. There is a 4,000 square foot mural on 10th Avenue in Vancouver. The mural, the, mu the, mural, the mural was created by Musqueam and South Asian artists. There is also a plaque on the sea wharf which com commemorates Gurdit Singh Sarhali and those aboard the Komagata Maru. And it wouldn't be until 2016 that Prime Minister Trudeau formally apologizes to the South Asian community. So here we are living in a place where those who have held this land in their hands and in their bones have had their land culture and children stolen. Living beside men and women who were used as slaves and then ruthlessly denied a meaningful existence in a country that they helped build. Working alongside those who we silently begrudge their wealthy lifestyle, not realizing that they had to pay with their lives and dignity to be here. Eating exotic food like it's going out of style, ignorant to the fact that in their lifetime, the owners may have been denied basic human rights, yet persevered through the harshest and darkest of times when their own country turned its back on them. Driving past multi-generational homes, wondering how many people live there anyway, not knowing that their drive and determination for a better world for their families propelled them to a country that didn't want them for so long and sought to stifle them out with bans and barricades and bulldozers. We are here to remember, to give voice to a long silent history. For in, go down Moses way my people go or as it was more eloquently said by Senator Murray Sinclair Ch chairman of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission many people have said over the years why can't you just get over this and move on and my answer has always been why can't you just remember this and until people show that they have learned from this, we will never forget. Thank you. Wow. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Giselle. It's a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
uh, a lot of people um, don't understand that their organizations were founded in these times, yes. that it's no accident the policies that you have in place that exclude certain people. This is not an accident. No. Mm -hmm. This is on purpose and it was designed this way. And a lot of us are working within these systems and these organizations. I mean, North Van Arts, you know, it's been over 50 years. This organization has been around. Uh, and how long has Presentation House Theater been around? Uh, since 1976. The same. Oh, right, the same, because they were the same, same. time. Yeah. Yes. So when you think about um, the prevalent belief systems that uh, really upheld racism at the time both of our organizations were founded, uh, and I'm sure many other people who are, are watching today are in that same boat, um, we, this work, this work of really looking at the core values and how they are expressed in the ways that we work, in the ways that can we communicate with people, uh, in the contracts that we write, all of these things make a huge difference. And I'm so excited that we got to have this conversation today and we are uh, running out of time. We've got eight minutes left. <gasps> oh my gosh. I know, I know. Seriously? It just flew by. Holy I mean, there's just so much to <laughs> oh talk gosh. about. So sorry. No, and I, I don't, don't, don't be sorry at all. Just you. Don't be sorry at all, <laughs> I think we please. we all had a lot to say. <laughs> we we uh, yes, we all had many things to say because we're all very excited to start this. And I really hope this is the first of, of many more conversations like this. Um, I would love to hear more voices because I believe that if we can get together as a community uh, and not just here in North Vancouver, but around BC and share these processes and share our moments of success and our moments of, oops, that didn't work right, then uh, we know we'll feel less alone in this process, which very conveniently leads us into Andrea's story. A story about a mistake that we made. <laughs> the mistake we made. <laughs> the mistake we made, which has to do with the bathrooms. Um, yeah, so as I said, when I got hired, the, the team here had already done work around a bunch of accessibility things, including washrooms. We had the gender neutral washroom signs. The washrooms also still had women and men signs on them. <laughs> So that was, yeah, <laughs> that was the thing, thing that people commented on sometimes. And we really did kind of occupy a bit of that weird middle space for some time. But then we had a situation where um, a couple of times some some women, um, some women who I, I believe were coming from a cisgendered female perspective would kind of come and say, you know, I'm not really comfortable with the gender neutral washroom. And it wasn't because, as, as what they would always say is, you know, it's not because I don't want a trans or non-binary person in the bathroom. It's because I'm not comfortable with a cisgendered man in the same washroom as me. And at first, uh, Kim and I, the artistic director, who's who's silently sitting over here, <laughs> we talked about it and we thought, well, there must be a way that we can accommodate everyone. We can accommodate this discomfort in the cisgendered women and while keeping a a open space for people of all genders and we made a mistake that was even that thought process was a mistake <laughs> but what we decided to do was change the gender neutral sign to say what did we do we said like men's and women's but non-binary yeah it was welcome it was it was, it was like blah, 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 blah. it was yeah, yeah it was terrible it was bad and basically the first time we had it was an awful. event after that it was yeah we all just shake our heads now like, you know oh it's God. like you do so much learning so fast in these instances that you instantly become so like i can't believe i even yeah. thought that right yes <laughs> so like we had an event um one of our box office personnel is non-binary and they came and they saw that and graciously wrote us a beautiful heartfelt letter yes. Um, so, so gracious of them kind of explaining that, like how it made them feel to walk into a building that had previously said gender neutral, despite also having the other signs, but the gender neutral sign and then see it adapted to now go back to enforcing a gender binary. Um, and so we had a bunch of conversations more <laughs> with various people, with each other, yeah. staff. And, and what, what I learned in that process is I went, oh, shoot. So what we did there is we prioritized the 
imagined fears of cisgendered women over the actual safety and welcome of transgender and non-binary people who, as, as you've explained, have a lot of experiences in bathrooms. <laughs> Bathroom safety is not a hypothetical experiment, but for cisgender women, we just, it's like, oh, I don't really like the idea, you know? And so we, we, we prioritized in the wrong space. Um, and the other thing, oh, I just blanked out on the other thing I was going to say. We took away the thing. Yeah, I was going to say something about the wrong the the learning, but I don't remember. Anyways, but that's the main thing was was prioritizing um, this sort of imagined safety versus actual safety. So yeah, what we did obviously we pr quickly took down those things we had taped over the signs. It was, it was yeah. so bad, yeah. and then since then we have also removed the men and women's signs and written a policy and a statement mm -hmm. around the bathrooms because we also wanted then what this thing made us realize is that our front of house staff, our people on the floor, as well as all of us need to have just like a clear answer when people come and say like, oh, why are you doing this? Or I'm not sure I'm comfortable with this. And we can say, well, we can really easily say, mm -hmm. here's why we're doing it. And also if anyone is uncomfortable with, cause there's still shared bathrooms, right? We have the, there's only one in the building, but we have one single person bathroom that anyone, if you want the single person bathroom, like we'll, we'll take, it's fine. No problems, but just, um, yeah. yeah, standing by, standing by that. So that was something we learned. That was a mistake we made. And something we learned. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing that. <laughs> it is so important to give ourselves grace and to be able to laugh at ourselves and just say, okay, whoops, messed that one up. Let's try that again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and not take it as a, as a knock to the ego. Well, and then I think the really valuable lesson I got there is something I've learned now has a name, which is called margins in accessibility, I think, which is basically when you're trying to think of accessibility, instead of going, well, we'll start by making sure it's really comfy in this case for the cisgendered people, and then we'll go out, you go, no, 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 who are the people who are the margins of safety in this situation? Let's make sure it's safe and accessible and welcome for them. And then like the people in the center are already safe. They're yeah. already okay. Right. And so you start, you know, so I, so I learned a new, new approach to accessibility in general, which is I think a useful uh, metric. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think a really important tool in this work is what you were just talking about, that part of writing the policy and so that everybody in the organization has a script to fall mm -hmm. back on when they are questioned about these things. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's one area that often is f falls short, you know, yeah. like they put up, let's slap up the signs for gender neutral washrooms, but let's not actually talk to our staff about yeah. this and then give them language so that they feel confident talking about this when a member of the public comes up to them and asks them about that. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I remembered the other thing I was going to say that we learned about it, which is also that having those signs that are like men and women, but non-binary welcome, that also assumes that you can look at someone and know if they're non-binary yeah. or, yes. you know, and forces people to out, out themselves if they yeah. want a different washroom. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that was the other thing we learned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is work that is put on non-binary people all the time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. Just wash your hands. Just wash your hands. <laughs> <laughs> so we are actually out of time, but I wanted to go over just a couple of minutes if that's okay, because we, we do have some questions here that people would like oh, sure. to answer. I'd give my consent to stay. Yes. <laughs> As Thank do I. Me too. Wait, I'll go downstairs. No, I'll stay up here. <laughs> Okay, I love this one. It says, do any of the speakers have insights or could point me in the right direction for resources or processes in decolonizing boards of governance structures for the arts organizations? That's not me. <laughs> um, I can say, I'm, so that's, I mean, that's a process we're on. I think one of the first things is definitely just like general education. We did the, uh, it's called the Kairos Blanket Exercise with mm. staff and board. It's a really valuable educational tool. It's facilitated. You, it's not just thing you read and kind of do. There's like a thing you bring someone in for, super valuable. I've also just started reading a document called, I think it's called Towards Braiding. I'll find out the actual title and the names I, if you want. Perfect. I mean, if you can send, send that to me, I'll include and it in the resource list. And it's kind of about organizational, like, um, settler and indigenous working together and learning how to not do the thing where you just kind of like 
the token, bring in a person, and then they can't actually make change and get frustrated and leave, and oppressed and leave and revolving door of that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. I think that could also speak to sort of board practices and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, Andy, someone sent in a very a question for you. Uh, are men included in the arts? Ooh, <laughs> that's a fun one. Because, yeah, it's a big statistical analysis that um, when you get to, let's say, the community level, I would say no. Generally, men are not as engaged in the arts. And I'm speaking specifically to the North Shore because I do know the numbers and I know uh, the reasons why many men feel like, oh, well, I can't be in that genre of arts because poetry is more feminine. Or um, I can be uh, an actor, but I can't be a dancer because that's more feminine. Uh, a lot of that femme phobia, I think, is the reason why we don't see as many men in community arts. However, when we look statistically at Canada, um, kind of like humanity, you know, uh, genders are pretty half and half. They're pretty even with male and female folks. Um, just generally speaking, but uh, from one statistic I saw just a couple years ago of the music industry, for example, um, there are 95% of music producers in so-called Canada were male. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So a lot of the people making the music that's supposed to be Canadian sound um, are really presenting a, a men's sound and what men think music should sound like. Um, so just 5% were women or non-binary people. Uh, in those producer roles where you are often making a lot of decisions about the music. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, we do see men included in the arts, um, but they are just generally seen at the higher upper echelons of um, either what is appropriate and acceptable for men to participate in, mm -hmm. or just in systems of power and privilege of what is what just makes sense for a man to be in charge, you know? Right. And what can our organizations do to encourage a change in that? Mm. Oh, I've got uh, two new bits of words. Um, we might all know toxic masculinity. Mm -hmm. Very fun. Uh, I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, oh. I should note, I joke a lot. You know, I say sometimes toxic masculinity is fun, but I do really want to make sure people know that is a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Anything toxic? It's not good. It's, there's a reason why poison control <laughs> does not have a department for toxic masculinity because they don't see it as a toxic thing. They think it's fun too, who knows? But uh, there's another term um, that I was introduced to. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, but I grew up in poetry circles, uh, specifically in East Van's Commercial Drive area, which is a historically queer, uh, femme positive community in comparison to the North Shore. Um, but a, a lot of um, what they celebrate there is tender masculinity. And tender masculinity is something that I see in a lot of guys in the arts where uh, they recognize what barriers are there. They know uh, how awkward and uncomfy things can be um, when we have these interactions and these uh, unraveling of patriarchy. Um, seeing that kind of tenderness show up, I think, is a really great way that um, just from a, a training perspective, a lot of organizations could benefit from seeing emotion just as valuable as logic. These typically male and female things um, are actually quite beneficial for all humans. We can all use emotions and logic. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one of those things that I think having a holistic shift in how we train ourselves um, you know, to, to gatekeep those spaces and to say, well, no, um, men can't come into this or we're not going to consider including men because there's also the level of, well, if we accommodate these cis, uh, you know, men, often heterosexual, if we accommodate them, how much energy are we spending on that comparatively? Um, in those cases, I think that's why education is such an important tool to use for your team because mm. you can't just say, 
all right, let's go make some space for men in the arts. Let's go, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, it makes me laugh too, where it's like, sometimes, you know, men just don't want to, that's a valid thing. And it's not necessarily our job to undo that toxicity within them. If they think dancing is too gay, that's not up to us as women in the arts or femmes in the arts to be able to solve for them. That is men's own problem. Um, so knowing that they are actually included at the highest levels very often, perhaps not as often seen at the community levels, but um, yeah, that's why it's so important that that work, that's for the men to do. They can do their own that undoing. we That we all have our own unlearning to do. And if we mm -hmm. want to be engaged in these processes, it has to start from an internal review and mm -hmm. uh, learning a little bit more about ourselves and how our frameworks have been um, put in place by the society that we grew up in. Mm. And I thought to wrap up, I'd love to ask uh, each person to share uh, a concept that they have learned about in their own learning process uh, re in regards to inclusion and diversity and um, something that really changed the way you think about the world and see the world. Um, uh, for myself, I, I recently had, um, I, I hired somebody to come do a training for my summer camp staff to work on making um, our camps more accessible for autistic children. And when she was talking about uh, the things that we could do to, to make the space better for autistic kids, um, I kept thinking, wouldn't this be better for all kids? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of times these conversations are framed as some kind of, uh, extra things we are doing to help these marginalized few people who we perceive as being a, a small percentage of the population. But every time we put in place something that to make one group feel more welcome and safe, there's this ripple effect. Mm. Yeah. Anybody else have a thought they want to share that something that really kind of rocked their boat? Okay. Well, mine was actually kind of similar. Like I just had it, it struck me at one point during the pandemic uh, and it was actually had to do with captions on things, but I realized how it's similar to what you were saying. Like when we think about accessibility measures uh, societally, when we think about these things in terms of helping, you know, say captions for, for people who, um, for deaf people or people with hearing impairment or other things for, you know, people with whatever accessibility needs they have, it, it feels like some people will talk about it like it's some kind of burden and this extra cost and this thing. And then someone will say, oh, well, you know, I like captions too, because sometimes I can't turn up the volume because I'm nursing my baby and it just makes it easier. And then all of a sudden people go, oh, well, that makes sense. <laughs> and you're like, yes. Okay. So it, it makes more sense to put on captions for the hearing person because they're in a situation where it's not convenient. It's inconvenient, right? but not for the person who, who needs them to access the materials and how frequently we have that. And it's, and it also links to the thing I was saying before about that margins mm. in thinking right. and how, as you said, it actually often makes things better for everyone. It meets yes. everyone's needs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Along those lines during the pandemic, you know, we got to see how much people can make their workplaces very flexible and disability advocates have been working to get that in place for so long. And companies have been saying, oh, that's too much work. We can't do that. Well, overnight, we proved it's not too much work. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of people, not just people with disabilities, a lot of people who don't identify as being disabled or having a disability uh, benefit from that because it's just good for everybody yeah. to have more flexibility in their work-life balance. Yeah. And a friend of mine pointed out to me several years ago, she said, you know, 
people talk about how much it costs to get, you know, vocal eye interpretation or ASL interpretation. It's like you spend a lot of money on the lighting designer so that sighted people can see the show. Like, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, well, yeah. That is so fantastic. You are correct. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I was going to, I, it's maybe, maybe it was one of, it's one of my aha moments. I've had a couple these past couple of years. Um, but I, part of the thing that, um, we do, uh, for black history is that we give books out to the classrooms. We provide books with, um, equity and diverse things. And I was at Indigo and I was looking for my books for my class and all of a sudden I saw this picture and it's called Una, I believe is the name of the book. And I forget the author, please forgive me, but it's called Una and it was a black mermaid with an Afro. Oh yeah. And I looked at it and I had to pause for a moment because never in my wildest dreams did I ever think that I would see a mythical figure that looked like me. Mm. Mm. Does that make mm. sense? Yes. And, you know, growing up in England, all we had were gollywogs. And if you don't know what a gollywog is, <laughs> I encourage you to Google it. Um, and that's all we had. And, and, and I remember being given a gollywog as a gift because that was the closest thing that looked like me. But looking through the books and doing the research for this program and having books that look like me and then books that look like my daughter who's mixed race and then having books with images of a whole host of people was, is so wonderful. And I remember just standing in Indigo, just almost weeping, but that's one of my favorite aha moments, thinking of all the young black girls and boys growing up now that will never not know that will never have just to have a gollywog. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyway, well, I know, that's we a should, weird uh, one, but <laughs> I love that story though. That's such a perfect illustration. Um, we should wrap this up now. Thank you so much to all Thanks of for you for us. this. Yes. This has been such an amazing conversation and I really hope I get to have more conversations like this. Uh, if anybody is watching and thinks, hey, I'd love to talk on a panel with Joyelle, you know, hit me up. I, I'd love to hear from you. <laughs> Uh, and if you have any questions that we weren't able to address, feel free to email them to joyelle at northfanarts.ca and I will pass that along. And I just wanted to wrap up with uh, this quote from the Squamish chief, Leanne Joe. It says, systemic change comes with facing our truth and the willingness to be uncomfortable enough to feel it in your heart, soul, and spirit. That's it, folks. Thanks so much for being here. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Oh, thanks, Kim. Oh, <laughs> yay. <laughs>